Um, so you want to begin? Should I? Should you, you're the one who said two minutes. Let's begin. Okay. All right. I guess we'll begin. Um, so hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm giving a talk on uh, how to teach single-digit cues. Even if you're not a single-digit cue, I think you'll probably still find it interesting. I'm actually kind of also titling this How to Not Get Stuck at Go. Um, and I want to talk about a couple of things. It's going to be a little different. I want to. How many people have been to a number of the uh, the teachers' workshops? How many people have seen Bill's already? How many people have seen one by the Korean professionals? Yeah. So a lot of you guys have seen both of these. I'm, I want to try and uh, talk about maybe why there's some disparate um, approaches that these two schools of thought are 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 laying out, and I want to talk about why th that might be. And um, I'm actually probably going to compare. Uh, learning Go to learning a musical instrument um, rather a lot. So I want to I want to talk about that. I want to explain maybe why there's some disparateness. How if it's kind of like learning a musical instrument, what that means for us. Um, and I want to wrap that in with the ideas of uh, Bloom's taxonomy. So if it is like this, what can we learn about some things that we already know about how people learn skills to uh, help teach better? And I want to also talk about sneaky tricks. These are not Go sneaky tricks. So if you're looking for trick plays, there's a door. All right. Um, so for starters, um, I think that the important thing is to uh, understand that, that learning Go is going to be like learning any other skill that we acquire. And I'm going to compare it a lot to learning a musical instrument. Um, some people, I was originally going to say guitar, but I think I want to use piano as the metaphor of the day. Because guitar, I think some people can be very happy learning like three chords. And they can make a lot of nice noises, and they can sing along, and like Nickelback can turn that into a very lucrative career. Um, whereas with a piano, I think it's a little harder. You know, if you get a couple chords, you still want to um, have a better grip on theory and, and scales, and you need to learn more technique if you want to start practicing them and, and get better. So I think that the big disparity between what you've been hearing from the let's learn capture go in a very non-threatening manner and oh my god, students have no time for Capture Go. They're going to be in, say, by the time they're six. You know, They don't have time to get these bad habits. And the difference, I think, is that, um, is that when somebody has decided that they want to learn to play Go, you cannot stop them. On the other hand, very few people ever actually make that decision. And I think it's a lot like learning to play the piano. How many people here took an instrument at some point? How many people, their parents made them do it? How effective was it? Not very. Not very? How many years did you? I studied for a long time. That, and how long did it take you until you studied f of your own free will and volition? Twenty years. Twenty years, right? Okay. How about you? You guys as well? Uh, I stopped. You stopped after your parents stopped making you. Hmm? Stopped after. Well, uh, it was, we, we, we moved and there was opportunity. Uh, and so exactly, things get in the way, right? And yourself? Stopped after college. After college, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh. So why did you start <laughs> go with the other one? Do you like it better? Um, there was more opportunities for it in uh, the curriculum. Did your parents make you? Um, no, I was made to take piano lessons. Oh uh, yeah. But piano really only fits into like jazz band in middle school. So, so it didn't have applications for the rest of your life. Yeah. So Got it. it. Just really to like percussion, which carried me through. Like, yeah, you can bang on anything, right? Yeah, yeah, great. All right, cool. So the uh, the idea with the whole it's like a musical instrument is that. Um, I think that a lot of the people who are approaching this from a, we don't teach them capture go, we gotta teach them efficiency, we gotta get them doing problems, we gotta, is because they're assuming that the student or someone, that either the student has decided or someone has decided for the student that they are going to get good at go, darn it. And so they are going to be in these classes and they're gonna learn these things. And that's a very effective way when we start talking, how do we present, once the motivation exists, whether that is fear of God, fear of your pr parents, or love of the game, love of an instrument. You know, you say you still play after 20 years. What is it that keeps you practicing? No, I stopped you stop practicing again. All right, see? Then this is the other thing, is that um, the fundamental thing I want to talk about is that learning and getting better at Go, beyond Capture Go, beyond life and death, or beyond, like, learning what eyes are and what Seki is, is that learning Go is work, and it is hard, boring work. Hard, boring work, one of my themes. And that hard, boring work the best we can do is try and gussy it up. Um, we can have sneaky tricks that will make work fun, uh, and we want to make this hard, boring work really efficient and effective, but there is no way you can make a student want to do the heavy lifting. If you could kindle a passion 
for a student that they really want to be five down. They will be, but if you knew how to reliably kindle that passion in people, please fix the rest of the education system first, okay? Because that's, that's what's really hard. We want to teach people how to become motivated to the point that you want to practice your scales because you want to be good, right? Whether that's competitiveness, I want to keep up with my friend, my friend is getting better than I am, I can't have him being better than me, you know, like that competitiveness is one thing that really motivates people to do hard, boring work. It's very effective. Um, so for single digit cues specifically, at this point they've already learned the game, they've already got the basics, they've already seen how eyes work and Seki works and life and death works. So the, the question is, have they made that commitment? Let me take one big step back. <laughs> big disclaimer, I have not been teaching Go for 60 years like some of the illustrious personages in this room. I have not been playing Go for 60 years like some of the illustrious personages in this word room. Um, these are my thoughts specifically. I've been teaching a single digit Q class at the Go Center for three months now, and that's way too soon for people to have gotten better at all. Like, I, so I've been playing Go with, with Bill over here for a while now, and. Uh, I, we've been reviewing games, and I think he's been teaching me more than I've been teaching him. I think he's been teaching me um, humility, uh, you know, facial hygiene. I think I've been working on a nice beard from him. <laughs> um, but I don't, th I, so, so when I say that this is how to teach, please understand that it isn't. It's my experiences so far, my very untested, very unproven assertions about what work and what doesn't, and just my personal, how I personally studied. Um, I'm only 5D, just like that nine-year-old. So really, take this all with a grain of salt. 5D is still very weak. Um, so um, with all that out of the way, uh, I want to first switch over and talk about Bloom's Taxonomy, um, which is kind of interesting. Let me tell you. All right, so Bloom's Taxonomy, actually, as it was illustrated to me, was illustrated with a cup, which I happen to have. I don't know who left it here. Um, Bloom's Taxonomy consists of six steps. The first one is knowledge. So knowledge is just the basic, do you know what something is? Knowledge is, do you know how to capture a stone? Knowledge is cup, C-U-P cup, this is a cup. Number two is comprehension, where you sort of know what it is and what it's for. So you might know what capture go is, right? And you might know how to capture cutting stones, right? So comprehension, you might know that cups are for drinking. That's comprehension. Most, most teaching in school is knowledge and comprehension. When was the Battle of Hastings? Who was the 47th president? You know, this is the very basic knowledge and comprehension stuff. Oh, and the third part is also about as far as most of schoolwork goes. Knowledge, comprehension, application. This is a cup. We drink from cups. Let me drink from this cup. Blah, 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 right? That's application. Uh, you know, I know a net. Nets are how we capture cutting stones. Let me capture this net, this cutting stone. This is sort of the basics of Bloom's Taxonomy. Four, five, and six are where things get interesting. Four is analysis. Analysis is breaking it down into parts. This is a cup. It's got, you know, it's made of glass. It's got these neat ridges. It has a base. It has some sort of weight. You know, we can break it down into its component parts. It's got a rim. In this case, it's half full or half empty of water, depending on your, you know, philosophical persuasion. Um, analysis is breaking things down, you know, where you analyze, you know, this, these stones have this many liberties. These stones have this many eyes that's sort of decomposing something into chunks, which is super useful for oh, analysis. Here's a school example. Like, what were the causes of the Civil War? Analysis, like you sort of pick something, pick it apart, you can write a nice analytical essay. Number five is synthesis, which is taking what you know about what it is, how it works, using it, and what its parts are to do something new with it, right? So synthesis is, um, you know, you could turn this cup you could actually float this cup in water. You could turn it upside down and catch a bug. You could use it as a paperweight. Um, this cup, you know, has, based on its properties, might make a really good paperweight, but a really bad, you know, bug catcher if it has a chip in the rim or whatever it is, right? Like, so synthesis is this whole idea of using things to do new things with what you know about it already. And then the last step, which is the super fun one, is evaluation, which um, is, is this a good cup? Is it any good? What's it worth? Well, is this cup better than this bottle? Why, right? These are the hard, and this cap is open. <laughs> Sorry. Um, these are the hard questions, right? The evaluation of like, 
you know, saying what is something worth, right? That's a hard question. Um, what's something worth? Is it, is it good? Is it better than this other thing? Why? You know, these are the harder questions. So like, like the, you know, what are the causes of the Civil War might be your analysis. Synthesis is developing some new opinion on maybe some figure there and saying, you know, well, was, was fighting the Civil War worth it? Is that like, you know, that's a hard question. It makes people think on all levels, right? Okay, this is about go though, right? So brief observation is that these are easy and these are hard. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. Um, so, and I think that the other reason why we see this big disconnect between the, so I'm gonna use Eastern and Western, but please don't think that they are Eastern or Western. They are merely the fact that we've seen the Korean professionals say, God, these kids need to start doing problems immediately. And we've been like, well, let's all have Kumbaya and learn Capture Go. <laughs> No offense, I think these are both beautiful things, is that we're talking about different problems. One is how do you get motivation, and the other is how do you get the groundwork down? Because to get somebody to one down, there's a very finite list of skills. I could, I could write the skills that you all need to know to get to one down right now. They are, you need to read and visualize, right? Then you need fundamental shapes. And then that's pretty much it. If you can read and visualize and you can know fundamental shapes, that's almost all of what you need to get to Wondon. And in fact, a lot of these little kids running around who are Wondon, they have done this part. And they've been tricked into doing the deliberate practice because they're way too young to do hard, boring work. So um, if this is all we need, though, and this is really easy to acquire when you're young. <laughs> How do we get at it when we're, when we're old? And that's where the sneaky tricks come in. Because we're old, we have to use sneaky tricks to make ourselves do these. Because believe me, man, my brain is not as limber as it used to be. And their little brains are just like <laughs> Anyway, so we can do it, though. We can do it. It's just we need to use the sneaky tricks. Oh, beyond fundamental shapes, you then need basic direction and rudimentary strategy, like the don't play near thickness of the world, right? And don't use all your own aji, right? These, there's a basic list of these principles. You could memorize them. And in fact, maybe you have. Um, when Yang says, hey, don't play near thickness, you're like, oh, I've heard that before. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Direction of play, oh yeah, I know what that is, right, yeah. Okay, so how are we doing so far? Um, any questions so far? Any questions on Bloom's taxonomy? Are you on who, was Bloom? uh, who was Bloom? I don't know. He's an educator, I think, in the in the early 1900s. Maybe no. I think it was actually around where psychology was getting started. Yeah. There's actually a lot of disagreement about whether four, five, and six lead to each other or are all kind of equal weight. I think six is really the important part, but I'll come back to why in a second. Um. So, go. Anybody know how to play go? I don't know. How to play go. <laughs> Okay, um, but we want to start really quickly. Any, have, have people heard of deliberate practice, the term, the leadership idea? So everybody heard of 10,000 Hours, Malcolm Gladwell's book? Did you read the other one, Outliers, which was much better than Malcolm Gladwell? <coughs> Personal opinion. Um, Outliers was a very good one. They cite from many of the same sources. We use, these are original academic sources. Um, Erickson came up with this idea, this paper by Erickson. You can, I'll write that down. Um, you can Google him up. He wrote, what are the keys to deliberate practice? And um, the four key components that he noticed in these people who, you know, swimmers, typists, violin players, pianists, chess players, you know, whatever it is, they all seem to have this concept of deliberate practice. And the ones who got better, practiced better, focused better, and made sure that their practice had these four deliberate components. The first one was motivation. <laughs> this is, again, why they're like, are your parents making you be here? Or do you love the game? Or you know, why are you playing Go? Um, motivation was the first one. They have to be motivated, and they have to be exerting themselves to get better. The, the exerting themselves thing is that this is not just the rote execution of a skill that they've already acquired. They have to actually know, uh, actually be exerting themselves and trying. Um, as someone who's been teaching my single digit Q class, I've been giving people homework. This guy does it. He's also one Don already. 
So I haven't actually helped him at all. He already is doing the actual work. These other students are like, oh, I lost it. <laughs> like, I gave you a piece of, I printed out problems and handed them to you, and you just like throw it in the air and then come back next week. And you're like, I'm not any better. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So, you know, um, oh, gosh. So motivation is that first one. And I think that uh, if you have motivated students, the important thing to be able to do is to keep, like, the curricula of Go is straightforward, and you probably don't need me to tell you that because there's lots of good books on these subjects. I could recommend books for each of these four subjects. If you'd like me to recommend your books on each of these four subjects, I'll talk your ear off. Um, but I want to talk more about how you should be practicing because we're old and we know what there is to learn. What we don't know is how to learn it. So let's go back to the deliberate practice. First step is motivation. Uh, am I going too fast? No, you, you're perfect. Cool. Okay. You're highly motivated. Yeah, right. <laughs> So uh, is that at the comprehension level, or are you guys ready to start, start apl applying all this here? Right, okay. Oh, the second part. The second part is crucial, is that things be at or just above your level, um, which means you can't be, oh, I got a book of Chinese Go problems that is just so damn hard. As somebody comes in, they tell me, oh, yeah, I'm trying to go through Igo Hatsu Yoran. I'm like, dude, you are 8K. What are you doing? Igo Hatsu Yoran is a, is a famous, this is for the, the guy running the camera back there. It's you know 17th century book of problems, still worked on and practiced to this day. Absolutely not useful to anybody who is not already almost a professional. Like these are really, really complicated problems. I got a book uh, of similarly just way too hard Go problems for me. I can stare at it for five, 10 minutes. I won't get the solution. It's not useful. It's not at my level. So. When you're practicing, you need to be doing things that are at or just above your skill level. And usually these should be designed by someone who is your coach, right? So usually your coach knows what you need to work on. They give you problems. They, they say, you know, hey, uh, you really need to work on this. Just focus on this, right? This is sort of the analysis idea, right? Where you want to be able to, to, to f dial in one part of your game and practice it and have someone who says, this is at or just outside your level, and I know that because I'm above your level. That's sort of one good thing that teachers can do. Um, so that's the second part, is that it needs to be at or just above your skill level. And the third one is um, feedback. You have to get feedback as quickly as you can. They actually say that for practice to be deliberate feedback, you need immediate informative feedback. Um, and this is one of the reasons why people almost always start with problems, because problems can give you immediate feedback. You do the problem, you check, you think you do the problem, you check the answer, you get your feedback. Boom, 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 right? So this is how kids get this reading and visualization and fundamental shapes very quickly, as almost all of their exercises that they're forced to do train these back and forth very quickly. I mean, these are very linked, reading and visualizing and the fundamental shapes, right? Joseckis. Oh, th so, sorry, when I say fundamental shapes, I mean... Basic Joseckis, life and death, L group, L plus two group, tripod group, you know, like these things are just, you know, this is, these are the building blocks to playing a Don level game of Go. And believe me, Dons will still mess up basic life and death, but they will mess up a lot less of them. <laughs> Let me tell you, I messed up a life and death today. <laughs> uh, we don't want to go there. <laughs> Flip the board over. Anyway. The important thing is that playing games, and people get on KGS and they just bang out 20 games. They don't get better. Why not? Because the feedback of what moves are bad is not present. The you make a mistake, it might be 30 moves until it's clear. Or even worse, you may play a move and it never occurs to you that it wasn't sente, right? Like, and they answered it. So you think it's sente. So you keep playing it, right? Like, so, so this idea of feedback is very hard to get when you just play games. Uh, Go has a lot of silent information, where you play a bad move and your opponent plays a bad move. Nobody knows they were bad moves, so you guys keep playing them, right? Because it, and, and it's very hard to get that feedback. So anyway, feedback should be uh, informative. And uh, when I say immediate, I want it to be as quick as possible. So getting a game reviewed at the Congress that you just played is great. Getting a game reviewed that you played at three Congresses ago, not as useful. So informative. And immediate. God, I feel like a teacher, man. I should have been a teacher. Anyway. Um, and then the last component of deliberate practice is 
iteration. Once you're doing this, do it over and over and over and over and over again, right? Um, let's see. So that's deliberate practice. That's Bloom's taxonomy. And let's tie the two together. So the hard part about Go, as we talked about, is this problem with getting feedback and how it can be hard to get do good practice because feedback becomes problematic, especially if you've done problems. And it, I can tell you right now, none of us here have done enough problems. The other problem is doing problems is boring. This is bro doing problems is hard, it's boring, and it's work. And playing Go is super fun. Sometimes I mean, playing Go can be super fun. How about that? Uh, more importantly, we play Go because it is fun, right? So this is again that problem of motivation. If we're playing Go because it's fun. And you're telling me I have to do hard, boring work to get better. You know, screw this. I'm going to go play, you know, soccer. I'm going to go talk to girls. I, like, there's other things we can do with our time, right? But we all, we all have to answer this question of why motivation is important. Like, we all have to know why we want to get better. And if we're talking with our students in the single-digit classes, Q classes, that, quote, want to get better, hopefully they've answered this for themselves. So if you're stuck, start here, <laughs> right? If you're stuck and you know people who are stuck, start here. So one of the things I've been doing in my classes is just say, let's think about Go and why you're here. And don't ask them. We don't really care what their answer is. We just want them to think about it at the beginning of the class. Um, the idea of setting the intention, man, is it's not you know, a new age idea. It's just the idea that calling your thoughts to why you're here is more useful. Great little study. This is a little aside. Um, there uh, is two sets of people who go to the gym, a control group, a study group. One is on treadmills. One is on treadmills in front of televisions. They do the same exercise program. They do the same series of progressive exercise programs. And according to every possible metric we know, you know, VO2 max, standing heart rate, uh, performance, endurance, times, you know, whatever it is, the group that does not have the television does better than the group that has the television. The idea that paying attention to what you're doing helps you do it better. And more importantly, it like, helps you actually get measurable, observable, provable, uh, physical, like, uh, did I mention measurable? Measurable differences when you pay attention versus when you don't pay attention. Yeah, Bill, what's up? Even though they're technically doing, Even though they're technically doing the same work. It's amazing, right? It's an amazing result. And this actually has huge implications to what we should be doing when we sit down and say, okay, I'm going to practice Go now. It's like, are you caring? Are you I know some people who watch anime as they try and play Go. I don't know them. They just tell me that it's on as we're kibitzing in KGS. They're like, oh, I better turn the anime off. It looks like you're a good player. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Guess you better. All right. So, um, so the first one is motivation. At and being just above your skill level is something students can figure out for themselves. So here, let me take a big step back. What we want to talk about here is what can you do for your students and what, what can your students do for themselves, right? So because, again, we're assuming that t students have hit the motivation. So as a teacher, your job is to point them at the books, and I recommend that you point them at the books, right? You'd be able to say, so in my classes, I frequently am like, hey, that's in this book, that's in this book, that's in this book. And I think I have had people say, hey, that's kind of useful because maybe I should go read those books. They've been on my shelf for a long time, right? What is it Leanne says? She's like, oh, yeah, I read Tsuji 30 years ago, I think. <laughs> you know, I'm like, all right, that's, that's great. Do you know it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what else? Tsuji. <laughs> so, so anyway, but like if students are motivated, you can keep pointing them at this stuff. But what are the things that students will need help on? And that's probably the feedback. And that's because Go is sneaky. Go is, uh, it, it, there's a long distance between the mistake and the punishment. Um, and, that, and in s some cases, it's even invisible that the mistake was a mistake, right? So that's why feedback is important, which takes me back to Bloom's taxonomy. The first part that people need to do to get to one done is they need to have knowledge and comprehension of application of this basic ability to visualize moves, know the Joseckis, play them in not dumb ways, presto, one done, right? This is the, the part, like you can get a lot of that out of this, right? The hard part becomes when you need to um, 
So you know Joseki, and you can analyze Joseki, and you can visualize, and assuming you can visualize all this stuff, and you can visualize the life and death that follows, then you know the analysis, and you can break down what the important parts of the board are, and you can synthesize what Joseki is to choose in the right way. So far, so normal. The hard part, frequently, is that whole problem of coming up with mistakes, coming up with our feedback. So when we go back and re review our games, the hard part for me is evaluation. So I have students who I say, please send me your games. We'll go over them. And they send me their games. And there is no commentary. There are no questions. Like, they have played this game, and they would like me to somehow tell them everything that was wrong, as if this process whereby I just give them feedback directly is sufficient for them to have suddenly acquired the knowledge that it was a bad move. And my hunch, currently unproven, is that that is not enough, is that one of the important things that we need to do is teach students how to ask questions about their own Go game. Um, that's the hard part. The hard part is when someone says, Hey, this, was, this move maybe wasn't good enough. L let me put it another way. This is Go. This part here is like the, go, the hard part of Go. Why are computers bad at Go? Because they can't do this step. <laughs> like chess is really easy to evaluate. Do I have a queen and you don't? I'm probably winning. <laughs> right? Like it's really easy. Evaluation for chess is a much more straightforward problem. Evaluation for Go is a much harder problem. In some, you could say that evaluation of positions for Go is the hardest problem. Um, and so for us, trying to think at this level, when we are evaluating our own moves, it is hard work to say, was my move slow? Was it necessary? Did I have to play here at all? Is it better if I play over there? Like, coming up with these questions is not as easy as, oh, I can just catch it, whatever, I catch it, and then that, so I play there, they, they die, right? Like, like, that's easy, but was this right at all? Was this in the right direction? Did I get enough? That's actually one of my favorite questions to ask yourself, to ask my students. Did you get enough? So you're attacking this group. Did you get enough? Well, how much did you need? Well, what else is there, right? Like, that's one of those questions that gets at evaluation. So as you're talking about I like people are taking notes. It's like, oh my God, bless your hearts. My students at the Go Center don't take notes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, are you? Good, good, good. No, but seriously, that question, did you get enough, is a great question to ask about your Go game. Um, my teachers always asked me that in China. They said, did you get enough? And I was like, I never really thought of that. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> All right. Um, but these are harder questions to ask, and they're harder to spontaneously generate. So if you have students, get them in the question of the Socratic method, learning by asking them questions, um, when we, particularly with the 9 by 9 stuff. Well, what else could you have done? Did you have other options? What did you consider? Why did you consider that one? Is there something better that you could consider? Hint, 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 hint. I mean, that's not really the Socratic method, right? That's telling them they're wrong in a nice way. So there's, there's a nice way to use the Socratic method, and there's the, the not nice way in the Socratic method. It's like, do you think you could have done something better than that? Is not the Socratic method. <laughs> what were your reasons for picking this move? That's the Socratic <laughs> method, right? OK. Um, so uh, let's see, evaluation and why that's hard, evaluation and why that's the thing to teach your students to do. I guarantee you if you can get people thinking about their own game and asking questions about their own game, then they will figure out for themselves how to get better. Because if they're saying, was this right? If they're saying, could I have done something better? If they're asking that to a seven down, if they're asking that to their stronger friend, that's great. Like, Everybody, if you're reviewing a game, have at least two questions for it. Don't just like show the pro and expect them. Because that quest where you look at the board and you try and evaluate it and you have a question about it is the gateway to, I don't know, maybe getting better. I don't, I don't know about that part. I was going to say gateway to all knowledge, but I don't know what all knowledge is. So, all right. So that's, that's kind of the last thing I wanted to say about Bloom's Taxonomy. And um, the l I guess the next thing is nobody wants to do hard, boring work, because hard, boring work is boring. And because we're smart monkeys, we come up with ways to trick ourselves into doing things we don't like doing. And if you haven't come up with ways to trick yourself into doing things you don't like doing, 
<sighs> God, being an adult sucks. Um, but sneaky tricks work, like the whole idea of giving yourself a reward for unloading the dishwasher, or, you know, I won't goof off until after I've, you know, cleaned the cat box, or, you know, whatever it is, right? You get yourself these sneaky tricks that we can use to distract ourselves. And, and maybe some people will tell you they have fun doing Go problems, right? That's because they have succeeded at tricking themselves into having fun doing Go problems. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I mean, seriously, doing Go problems is kind of fun if you can get into that flow state and if you like, feel like you're doing good, but banging at a Go problem that's just sitting there, you're like, I still don't know. You know? Okay, so, so the sneaky tricks is actually one of the things, uh, who has something they hate doing that they figure out a way to make themselves do it, and what's the best way to make yourself do it? Yeah, what? Flossing yourself. Really? <laughs> That's fabulous. All right, and it works? It works in that it, you floss like? Uh, you, like floss in the shower. you leave it in the shower. The mirror, uh, I, I bought a bowl. Mirror, so you can. Genius. Genius. Yeah, the shower is the best place to solve all your problems. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Things they hate to do that they've got some trick to make them do it? <laughs> Take it outside. All right, next, next, next suggestion. All right, next suggestion. Anybody? Any, nobody else has things they hate to do going to the gym? Yeah, yeah? The fixed schedule, the discipline schedule really helps, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah put, put 15 minutes to go problems on it before and after going to bed. Or before going to bed and not after going to bed. After waking up. <laughs> yes. If you can do them after going to bed, that's a good trick. That's right, exactly. Well, that's the other thing is that you need to do it first. Um, yeah, yeah. Just having a goal. Having a goal. Some motivation. I want to, yeah, you'll never win me, though. Sorry, you need another goal. Mm. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. All right, anyway, that, but that's another great, like, very primal sort of, uh, sort of goal to have. Mine is to be in the strong players room every year. I'm at 25. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, it's tough. We need bigger Congress venues. The Santa Barbara Congress had 50 boards, I think, in the strong players room, so I, was comf <laughs> I would have been comfortable there. Anyway, anyway. Everybody's got a goal, yeah. yeah. Any anybody else have, have things that they tricks to make them do things they don't otherwise like doing. I read the internet all the time, and my tricks to stay off of Reddit are to actually disconnect it. Like, just DNS does not resolve for reddit.com, which <laughs> is fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. I love that this is a joke. That's a joke that everybody here gets. That's great. OK, um, so the other sneaky tricks to make ourselves actually do work. I think of my disappointed girlfriend when I tell her I've been playing Civilization V all day or something else useless, right? Like, contributes nothing to the good of society. Anyway, other ones? Other ones? Anybody? Nobody has any other bad things that they don't like doing that... I don't do them. You just don't do them. <laughs> Are you getting the point here? <laughs> so how do you study to get better at Go? Very minimally. Oh, I see, I see. Not zero. So the other thing about these sneaky tricks, for, so for instance, the competition and the goal setting, that's a great way to make it fun. Um, having friends, also a great way to make it fun. Uh, Rochester Empty Sky Go Club ended up with, I think, five people above one Don. They had two Don, three Don, three Don, five Don, six Don, Gus was of the Empty Sky. And these, these kids, they all would just hang out every day. They had Go Club that met four times a week. Mm. Why? Because it was super fun to get to trash talk your friend, and figure out how to get better. And they would do problems with each other. And they'd be like, you don't know how to do this? I know how to do this. You don't know how to do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is one that I did one year where I had a friend of mine who was always deviated, one, one rank stronger. Oh, yeah? Of 100 bucks by the end of next oh. year. By the next Congress, that he... Did it work? No. No! <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? I don't know. I took lessons. With yeah? You took lessons? Studied, yeah. Yeah? And you so took lessons? Yeah. Yeah. Did you do any of the deliberate practice part? And also, how strong are you? Because we hit some diminishing returns. Oh, that's hard to get to 3Q. Yeah? They stuck here for a long time. A long time. Have you got some tips, some ideas for what you're going to do now? I'm really liking this. Okay. There's yeah. a lot going on here. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, forget teaching. I don't want to teach anymore. <laughs> <laughs> also, my rate is $30 an hour. No, I, I don't know anything. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I figured out the best way to like, learn to sushi. Uh -huh. To make a really steady, really aggressive go style. Really? Really? 
that's certainly one way to do things. I know some people play a, a very different fuseki so that they, yeah. Mm hmm. That that might work. You might also be running into the problem where the feedback comes back late, right? So. Uh. <laughs> so this is also the source of that proverb: "Lose your first hundred games as quickly as you can." Have you heard this one? Yeah. That's what this is about. This is about the idea that you're getting this quick feedback, and what you're learning is not going to be immediately obvious. So don't worry about it. Just soak in your first hundred games. Lose them and try and go from there to, to figure out maybe, okay, maybe now I should start figuring out how to read. But um, if, so the tips to the actual Go players, not the teachers, the tips are, the first thing is reading and visualizing. So my problems have always been about ladders and nets because they don't fork, like they don't branch, and you may have to visualize 25, 30 moves. Visualize the whole thing, right? It's just like the ladder where you move it back progressively that's teaching people this visualization skill, which is the foundation of all Go, right? Um, Yang has this, uh, I think Yang has the, the saying, you know, when you're cut, you hold up two fingers. You say, can I catch it in a net? Can I catch it in a ladder, right? Or can I catch it in a ladder? Can I catch it in a net, depending on who you talk to? Um, and the reason that's the most important part isn't because you say this when you get cut. It's because you say this before you cut the other guy, and then you actually say it three moves before the cut ever shows up, and then 10, and you're like, oh, if I do this, then when I cut, I won't be able to catch those moves, so I better play this forcing move, and then you're playing go, oh my gosh, then it's a totally different game. Anyway, but the beginning is this reading and visualizing. So lots of problems, and problems should be at your level, at or just above your level. So the graded go problem for beginners, that's a great set of books. Um, don't immediately start doing everything. But you also need to um, get this feedback. Oh, and the iteration part. <laughs> you gotta do a lot of it. It's, uh, there's no way around that. Um, the other thing is that, is that while this at or just above your skill level is nice, you also need to be exposed to these new ideas, right? To Suji, um, going through the Graded Go Problems book is only useful if you sort of know what Tsuji are, right? So if you've read the Tsuji book, you've heard of the belly Tsuji. And that's something you look for. You may not see it, and you may not see it immediately, but since you know it's there, you might start looking for it. That's the other thing where, like, fundamental shapes, like Joseki, life and death, basic to Suji's. You know, that's, that's Don, then direction, and then the strategy, is, which is kind of like the direction. Um, but it also includes things like forcing moves and timing. Endgame is not on this list. <laughs> Endgame is not on this list. Okay? Okay. I say that because I hate it, and I don't know how to play. Um, I think that's actually all I have prepared. Does anyone have any questions for me? I'm sorry, Bill. I'm 20 minutes under. I just You're only 10 minutes under. 10 minutes under? Oh, sorry. oh, phew. All right. Any questions? Um, so wh what's your teaching structure? How do you arrange classes? Um, so I've been trying to give people the exercises and try to just bang on the, the fact that reading and visualizing is important. After that, I want people to start to, to be playing. So the... Sorry, I should rephrase this. Do yeah. you teach in a physical setting? Is Suji sitting at tables or are you on the internet? Or I go to the Go Center on Wednesdays, and whoever shows up is there. I've given people usually the week before problems, but then they're not here the next week because they're adults. And that's, this is the last part, is that at the point that you're teaching people who are above the age of 22, they have jobs, they have careers, they have screaming children at home. You know, they don't have time to sink three hours into online games where they give it their all, right? Because that's ridiculous. Who has that kind of time? I wish I did. Um, so, I, so your question of like, you know, do I have this format? Other than stressing that if you want to get better, you have to do this work. You have to figure out a way to trick yourself to do this work. You have to play the meta work, right? To make it fun. Um, I don't know yet because I haven't gotten people to improve very much, with the exception of some people who've shot up the ranks really quickly, but they're doing that without me. I, s you know, I drive past them and I see one of my students at the bus stop with their head in the go book. I'm like, I didn't do that. I had nothing to do with that. So, so question. Yeah. Well, I, I'm 4'2". I, I run a club. Yeah. Sure. Is there a way to, um, like, how would you recommend getting started doing this kind of teaching, considering I never know who's going to show up. Sometimes I'll have four people, sometimes I'll have 
if you can get people to make a commitment, that's great. Um, if you can give people homework assignments, if you can find out who's coming next, like, did you get tricked on a Joseki? Why don't you tell us about it next week? Like, figure out what it is and tell us about it. I don't know how to make people do consistent things because I only have had really informal lessons. This is, again, like, if I had somebody's parent making them show up to class, <laughs> it would be a lot easier. You know? <laughs> like, but I don't even charge money for my lessons, so I'm just teaching at the Go Center just because I think it's fun. I know I get a captive audience like, like this one. So when someone so. walks here and then yeah. And they say, I, I think I'm for Q. I do my classes like Nick Sabicki does his classes. He picks ideas. He's going to start lecturing on them. Somebody says they're for Q. I say, great, here's our problems for the week. What do you think of these? And they're usually a whole range. Um, but I don't really know because if somebody just drops in for one class, how much should I be able to teach someone who's here for an hour for one week? I don't, I don't care at that point, honestly. When someone is pestering me, if they send me an email at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning and they say, God, I misplayed this Joseki, what should I have done? I will be really happy to answer your questions. Likewise, if you have these things, you know, have questions, ask stronger players, make the que I actually gave a class on how to ask questions to stronger players, which goes something like this, don't waste their time, don't waste their time, and be as clear as you can, right? Like, just ask them clear questions. If you say, I thought this was bad, I thought I needed to worry about this, and when I say don't waste their time, don't waste their time means don't explain yourself, right? Have you, have, have you ever heard someone argue with a pro? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet, I, bet, I bet you do it. I almost always do it. I'm like, I really wanted to. Oh, shut up, <laughs> shut up. You know, it's like, oh, but I thought I had to. Nope, that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Listen to what they're saying. Ask good questions. Be as clear as you can. Right. Cool. Yeah, what's up? Blue Dot 3 is another not quite sneaky trick off your script. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Edward Kim's suggestion is to be able to do it in five seconds. That's a good one. I like, I like five to 30, depending on what stage yeah, of your practice is. Warm, I, so before tournaments, I'd always warm up with five second problems. Great to go problems for beginners. The fourth volume goes up to one Don. By the way, don't be embarrassed. You can carry it around. Proud. Be proud. Um, yeah, what's up? You have, you have in your bag? Says the one Don. Yes, two Don. Two Don. Yes. Um, let's see. What was the other thing? Oh. Uh, and this is the other thing about sneaky tricks. Switch it up. Um, you've been playing for a long time. You may have a way in which you do problems. Do it the other way. If you like doing one on your phone, do them on paper. <laughs> do them on paper where you've given your wife the answers. You know, do them in a way where that is different than how you usually do it, right? Um, if you don't review games, try reviewing some games. If you don't review pro games, try reviewing pro games. Um, the, whole, the other thing about tr sneaky tricks is that um, your brain wants freshness. So if you've been doing this, I, <laughs> I gave out a sheet of problems one week, and one guy was like, this is so much harder on paper. I usually just click on my phone, <laughs> and I don't really think about it. I just click until I get the right answer. I'm like, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. What have you got there? What have you got? All right. So, um, but seriously, so switch it up. And actually, if you do them on paper all the time, try it on the phone. Try doing the, the, the absorption of things above your level. Do problems harder than you can do. Um, and the other thing is this whole feedback one of the things that's really interesting, and which I personally am going to shout out for, is observing games of stronger players. And I don't mean putting on KGS TV where you put it on, you kind of zone out as you do, you know, like procrastinating. So you put on KGS, I'll just watch one more game, it'll be fine. You know, don't do that. That's not good. But you know what I'm talking about. If you watch KGS TV until the Wii Smalls, it's terrible. Don't do it. Um, but it is good if you pay diligent attention to the game because that's when you get this tight feedback. You speculate on the move. The player who's about five to six ranks stronger than you works best, makes the right move, <laughs> right? And you say, and then you have to generate why was their move better than the moves that I was thinking of. Um, that can be a very cheap way to get good deliberate practice time in. But it shouldn't be your only thing. You have to do a lot of these things. Anybody, anybody done that? I did it a lot. Yeah. yeah. I tried doing that with um, the Dutch Bowl tournaments. But that They're too far above you. It's got to be at or just above your level, that right? Was when I was just in fear of the the oh, I remember those days. Those were the days <laughs> back when I thought I was going to be pro. So I, I, uh, the other thing is that uh, in 2005, I went to China and I studied on one of those trips and for about three months. I was in Beijing, uh, and uh, I was two Don AGA at the time. Came back four Don AGA. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, right? They, they were good teachers. Why? Because I did problems all day. Um, uh, but I also went to a primary school, which was a, a boarding school. Parents would send their kids away. They had this old, decrepit ping-pong table that was like, it was deeply, deeply uh, 
Yeah, it was just, there was like three parts on one of them. I don't know how you do it when you hit these. Anyway, these kids, um, it was 50-50 boarding, boarding school and go school. So they would, they would learn go all morning, and they'd learn regular subjects all afternoon. There were a hundred of them, and they were all as strong as I was. <laughs> and then I realized I wasn't going to be a professional. So, you know, that's, them's the breaks. You know, that's, that's how it's going to work. So, anyway, um, but what's interesting also is you talk about this motivation. This is a problem at all levels. So, like, there's, you know, five, six, seven dons. People who have put in all the deliberate practice, they've got all of these basics, and they're looking, and they're saying, you know, for me to go be the best in the world, if I want to try and compete with professionals anywhere, they have to keep doing this. There was this great, um, great study of violinists. Um, the Conservatory of Music gets large numbers of musicians every year, and they categorize them into world-class soloists, people who can make a money doing per playing in orchestras, and music teachers, who will still be very good, um, but they will never rise to the level of like virtuosos. The you know, pick your favorite giant concert musician, Yo-Yo Ma. Probably everybody's heard of him, right? Like, or wha whatever the equivalent is. Like when people become internationally well known and renowned. And the interesting thing that they found about these three classes of people was that they all did about the same amount of practice. But what was different was the quality of practice was very different. Um, the people who were the world class were constantly, constantly hard on themselves. They were constantly working on something, and they were constantly trying to get feedback on it. And they would try and tighten that loop as much as they could. You know, that practice, it never became rote, right? It never became like, I'm playing the scales like I've done every day for 20 years, right? It's not like I'm doing problems like I've done them every day for 20 years. It, it, they had to keep it fresh. N but, and that was the difference between like the top of the top and the minimum of the top, and just, uh, believe me, we're n I'm not going to get there. I can try, but I'm not going to get there. But the point is that the motivation is really what becomes the difference. There was another great study in the 60s when this was sort of coming out. A Russian psychologist said, I could make anybody be a grandmaster in chess. He married someone from Russia who he ma arranged this where he'd never met the person who he married at all and said, it's better if you have never played chess, if no one in your family has ever played chess. I don't want any hint of genetics getting into this study. And his original plan was to uh, have someone who would become a grandmaster in chess, and much to his frustration, because this was the 60s, she only bore him daughters, or he only... Anyway, however you want to arrange that. He had four daughters, and he said, well, whatever the plan proceeds anyway. <laughs> Went on with the plan. Every single one of these daughters became grandmaster level in chess um, through this, this regimen where they would do the basics, you know, they, d they did all their other studies, but they were homeschooled and he controlled their schooling and they all became grandmasters in chess, so there's clearly no genes. He had never played chess before either and this was sort of like a bet that you do at a faculty meeting where you then get married to someone you've never met. I don't know who makes these bets. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is entirely serious and you can look it up. And these, these, because these four girls are all still around, but of them, while they all became grandmaster level, I think three of them have stopped because it was never their intrinsic goal. They have all the skill in the world, but it's not something that they find, I don't want to speak for them, but whatever they are finding for meaning, it is not sufficient to make them continue practicing. And while they're all grandmasters, none of them are the ones who win the tournaments or the ones who are considered our amazing natural talent prodigies, right? Except for one did, which we all knew. One did, right, one did. Um, and I think she's still, she's still competing, um, but all her sisters have not, right? And, and if you talk to them, they say, the one who's still there says, oh yeah, you know, she always practiced more than we did. She still practices more than we do. You know, she still is constantly, you know, anyway, she likes it more than we do, right? So anyway, as long as there's the motivation, there's hope. So I guess that's a good lesson to end on. Um, also, don't make bets where you have to marry people. Okay. <laughs> Thanks.